the reason why the reason why Boyana asked me to do this is that in a lot of debates you'll see debaters um, making up agencies that will um, follow through a specific policy that they can't do. They want to make Amnesty International change the laws in Nigeria. They think that the Security Council can protect the rights to privacy in Azerbaijan and lots of different things that don't make sense. So what we're going to be talking about today are the mechanisms through which human rights are protected. I'm not going to be talking about specific human rights. Um, um, I guess you already know something about that, as you've shown. But I'm going to be talking about who protects them, how they protect them, and what may be the advantages and the disadvantages of particular agencies that, that protect human rights. Um, now, I'd like you to take a look at these three statements that I've written down. And I want you to tell me whether you think they're correct, whether at least some of them are correct, uh, why they are correct, why perhaps they're not correct. If you can't see them, I'll, I'll read them out loud. Yeah. Mary killed Joe Veritushi violated his human right to life. That's the first one. Mark was fired because he was gay. The company violated his human right to non-discrimination. And the third one is the Taliban systematically violate women's rights. Are these statements relatively correct? Do, do you think they're correct? And, and, and specifically we're talking like this lecture is about agency on human rights protection, right? Keep that in mind. Are they correct? Well, right now there's a huge debate either human rights work only vertically or also horizontally. So the awesome. first one is certainly a horizontal aspect of either is it or is it not a violation of a human right. What do you mean by that, a horizontal aspect? The vertical aspect is between state and an individual. Okay. Horizontal is between individuals themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. And through the past, human rights developed on the basis of the vertical aspect. Okay. And some still claim that only the vertical aspect should be looked upon in the case of human rights as, as such. Right. That some other sort of rights that are institutionalized and normalized by norms given by countries should okay. work on the horizontal level and not the human rights. Okay. All right. Would everybody agree with that? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, okay. But you think this in regard to the first statement? What about the other ones? Who, are the, who, who, who is supposed to violate human rights here, in, in the first case? Yeah. It's Mary, right? In the second one? It's a company. The company. And in the third one? It's the Taliban. Are these the correct agencies? None of them is the state. None of them is the state, and that's the answer. The, none of these agencies can violate human rights. Only states can violate human rights. And this is not something that some people think, this is the predominant opinion in international law and in international relations. So it's really funny when you sometimes read news how oil companies in Nigeria violate people's rights uh, because they pollute their water and then people die. Which is really incorrect. It's the state of Nigeria that violates the human rights of their own people because they don't investigate, prosecute, and punish the companies that are responsible for, uh, uh, for, uh, for, the crimes, for the crimes that took place. So when we talk about human rights protections and mechanisms that give effect to human rights, we always talk about how states enforce human rights. So, yeah? So, you say that states can violate human rights? Yeah. Uh, so I'm not saying that, that states can, I'm saying that only states only can states. violate human but, rights. Uh, by saying states, you mean government, yes? And for example, in Palestine, when the ruling party now is Hamas, in the center of Gaza, mm -hmm. and Hamas violates women's rights, children's rights, or they enforce them to wear hijab, and so on and so on. So, right. it's legitimate, you mean? Or it's, le it's legitimate to say that the population, the women's population's rights, human rights, are being violated. 
But it's not correct to say that Hamas is violating those human rights because that is not because Palestine is not a recognized state. By the way, too, and I'm also recording it, so 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 you'll get that. Um, uh, so this is what we need to keep in mind, that for every mechanism that we want to use, we want to aim that mechanism at a state that violates human rights. So given and that Palestine is not recognized, there are no human rights violations in Palestine? Human rights violations definitely take place. The question is who is responsible and who can be held responsible for those violations. That, 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 that's the trick. And in all those situations, uh, the resolution doesn't come about because there is no one that you can hold accountable before a legal institution. Because that's the only way you can enforce human rights. So when we talk about the primary responsibility for the protection of human rights, like when we talk about promotion, also different actors come into play. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, but when we talk about the primary responsibility for human rights protection, we talk about the state. And what does the state have to do? Promote policy for non-violating. Precisely. But who does that? Like when it comes like to policy issues? Anything else? Uh... When it comes to policy issues, it's obviously going to be the executive. The government needs to pass policies that are in line with human rights standards. When we look at the legislative branch of government, you need to have a parliament that passes laws that are non-discriminatory, that don't violate people's rights. And thirdly, and in my opinion most importantly, you have to have national courts that strictly enforce all those human rights standards with regard to the actions of the other two branches of the government. Now, some countries are very successful at that, um, especially here, the European countries deserve a mentioning because the European system, the regional European system of human rights is supposed to be the most sophisticated and the most effective system for the protection of human rights in the world, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, towards the end of this lecture. Um, and some countries are a little bit less successful at it, because the national courts, perhaps because they're not independent, perhaps because they're under a strong policy influence from the executive branch of the government, simply don't want to do that, right? Um, but primary responsibility nonetheless lies within the government and most specifically uh, this is the role of national courts. So, so this, is, this, is like, this is still not the international level. This is, this is where the primary responsibility lies. And as debaters, I don't think you need to know much more about that because we get into technical details of national human rights litigation then and that, that's really not something that's, that could be useful for you um, in specific debates. On what other level can we protect human rights, if one is on the state level? International. The international level, but in two different senses. The law of war. The regional level first. No? Excuse me? Regional level? Um, no, that's not what I meant. What I meant is that you can protect human rights on an interstate level, where you have negotiations between two sovereign states that are trying to solve one particular issue regarding human rights violations, or we can talk about an international level where states cede their sovereignty to a, let's say, a relatively independent international body that then adjudicates on a particular human rights violation. It doesn't even have to be a judicial body. It can be a political one, it can be a quasi-judicial one that just makes reports, identifies violations, um, draws up documents that can later on be used in court cases where specific rights are being protected. But nevertheless, all these mechanisms do contribute to an international system of human rights protection. 
But let's stay on the interstate level uh, 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 for, for a while. One of the things that is extremely important when it comes to human rights protection is, qui uh, is quiet diplomacy. This is something that we don't read about because it's kept secret by governments. But when we have mass atrocities taking place in a specific situation, sometimes states will try to solve it not through an international body, but rather just through bilateral or perhaps even limited multilateral negotiations. By the way, um, if, the, if I use a word that you don't know or a concept that you know, please let me know so I can explain it because sometimes I just, I just think that people understand it because I've been in this for such a long time. Um, um, everybody knows bilateral negotiations, multilateral negotiations like involving two, two or more uh, sovereign states. Right? Um, who can give me an example for this? Like a very recent example. Malaysian Filipini a while ago. On, on what group, issue? On, on when a group of Filipinian extremists embarked onto a Malaysian island and proclaimed it their state. Okay, alright, alright. That that could be that could be one. An even more prominent one that we all read about. The US and Russia for the Syrian country. Yeah, US and Russia for, for, for whether or not we should protect exactly. human rights with force because chemical weapons have been used. Like this is this is really a classic example of how of how human rights protection can take place on an interstate level. Unfortunately unfortunately it's also an example where American diplomacy failed big time. I think for the first time they failed big time after the end uh, uh, of the Cold War. Another really important and co concept that's become some sort of a buzzword on this interstate level of human rights protection is the so-called responsibility to protect. Does anybody know what that means? Or what the concept is about? So, just uh, it, the concept that uh, the state and the government has a responsibility to protect its own citizens and even insist like the violence which is exercised in another country and if uh, the state or the government of another state failed this responsibility, it should like intervene as I remember and also to protect the people from this violence. But I'm not sure whether or not right. I one of the parties in this situation that you're describing isn't necessarily just the state, but we consider it to be the international community as a whole. Right? We're not talking about unilateral interventions for the protection of human rights. We'll, we're, this is not humanitarian intervention, something that happened in Kosovo, for instance, in 1999. This is still something that takes place in the legal framework that currently exists. exists. Therefore, it has to go through the Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, basically, the concept is that every single state has a duty to protect basic, uh, uh, basic rights and freedoms of its citizens. If the country is either unable or unwilling to do so, the responsibility to protect the rights of those individuals falls on the shoulders of the international community. And then the Security Council has to decide that a situation needs to be resolved. Now this all sounds amazing, but it doesn't really work in reality because it still keeps the extremely politicized check that is present in the Security Council and obviously in the, uh, in, uh, in the right to veto of the permanent members of the Council. Yeah. But under which legal framework is a country responsible for other countries? Like, where does the justification of, for example, like, why does the US have to like, look out for the rights in Syria, for that sake? Um, th th this, is, this is written nowhere. This is something international law works on di two different levels. One of the levels are treaties, where states explicitly consent to some human rights, right? And the other level is called a customary level, where through state practice, a certain norm regarding the protection of human rights develops just because states are doing it repetitively and because states believe that this is a legal norm. I know it sounds ridiculous, but 
international law to a certain point is not really law, it's really completely intertwined with <coughs> politics. And definitely responsibility to protect is one such concept, therefore it's also quite, um, I don't want to say useless, but I think it's overly optimistic. Uh, there was, yeah. Yes, um, no, universal jurisdiction is part of the RTP concept. It's so it's it's the other way around. Do, does everybody know what universal jurisdiction is? Uh, I just wanted to elaborate on that point. In okay. The hierarchy of legal acts in a country. You have constitution on the first, and then you have uh, international uh, international treaties, and something that is called basic uh, principles in international law, yeah. which is above all the legislation a country, uh, right. a country imposes, right. except the constitution. That is the basic... No, law that's, law. Not the, that, that's a misunderstood hierarchy. I, I don't think it's, it's very important in this case that constitution comes first, and then international agreements come second. But international agreements can be either actual agreements, treaties, or it can be rules that bind a certain state through a custom, right? Mm -hmm. And this is something that is starting to develop as a custom. Does anybody know of an example where this R2P concept was blatantly abused? Okay. Yeah? So, in the case when uh, Iraq and this Kurds situation, so uh, the rights of Kurds, uh, whether I pronounce it right. So yeah, and uh, uh, Iraq, it's used like chemical weapons against uh, citizens of that region. Right. And, um, right. Like international community waited some this help and uh, responsibility to protect from the U.S., but they did not do this. But that's a that's a different thing. That that happened in the nineties. This is a concept that developed in. 2001 and has been developing since then. That's an idea where unilateral use of force for the protection of human rights is allowed. This is not mm -hmm. such a concept. Okay. And a blatant misuse of this we could see a couple of years ago in yes. Libya. Well, what, what, actually, what did you want to say? Well, I was next door to Libya at the time, okay. so I wanted to test that. But in the newspaper two days ago, they said the UN said. I think we should have acted in Syria two years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I politics. Yeah, right? yeah, I remember, right? remember, I haven't been following the news the last three days since I got here, but yeah, but yes, I, I could okay. completely so... see them saying that. The problem is that in Libya, for the first time, the Security Council actually used this notion of responsibility to protect and they authorized the use of force in Libya in order to protect the fundamental rights of the civilian population. Uh, the, violations were, um, the violations took place uh, because of the actions of the Gaddafi government. What happened in the end is that the responsibility to protect was abused in order to introduce regime change in Libya. And from there on, China and Russia in my opinion, will never again say yes to the use of this concept if it's not going to be really strictly, strictly limited to a specific goal. Libya was damaging for this interstate level of human rights protection and the, the, the UN and the Security Council, in my opinion, won't recover from that very quickly. Yeah. So if, so uh, if this concept doesn't work for this current situation, will it work for the conflict between the US and Iraq in 2003? Or no? Or is, well, it doesn't mean like mm, responsibility to protect. In that time, in that time, in 2003, this was a concept that was only debated among scholars. Mm -hmm. And and when diplomats hear about scholarly concepts, they're <laughs> just like, yeah, you need a reality check, man. And, and, and nothing happens. But when you start to include diplomats, and this is also, you could say that this is a specific mechanism of human rights protection, this cooperation between the academia that in fact develops these norms and the diplomats that actually implement them in real life, right? This is sort of about law, 
but it's actually about politics because it's the diplomats that make the final decisions on whether a norm should be disregarded or whether it should be accepted and implemented. So this is this is this is the interstate level. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to say something about this concept of uh, responsibility to respect. We just right. mentioned an example uh, where it was a <coughs> but I think it is very important in regard to refugees, for example. Mm -hmm. It's responsibility to protect. Okay. Because when you have uh, uh, refugees in your country, then you have the responsibility to accept them and protect them. Yeah? Exactly. Exactly. I'm limiting. I'm limiting myself. Like the responsibility to protect is like a really broad concept. Yeah. What I'm focusing on here is the use of force in order to okay. stop human rights abuses. Of course, like this is just one of the three major parts of responsibility to protect. Then of course you have the responsibility to restore after you intervene, and before that you have the responsibility to prevent what's actually happening. And the... That's the more dangerous Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you assume what's going to happen? Uh, and, and, and this... So this is about, this is about the uh, interstate approach and how human rights in one state can be... in the, the respect for human rights can be enforced, promoted, and to a certain extent human rights can be protected by other states in a foreign territory. Um, now, on both of these levels, the interstate level and the, uh, on the, interstate level, and, uh, the level within the state, where we said the primary responsibility lies, one agency or agents in one group are extremely important. I mentioned them in the beginning. I mocked them, but I didn't want to do that. Which which agents would would that be? Yeah, in a broader sense. No, not, did you say the UN? No, not not the UN. The UN deals with governments. The Amnesty deals with the civil society. Deals with non-governmental organizations. So the international crime force deals with. Individual. No, that's also a governmental organization because it's established by states. Civil society initiatives and NGOs are established straight from the popular body and don't have an, a governmental intermediate. So like Amnesty International. Like Am like Amnesty International, like Human Rights Watch, like the International Committee of the Red Cross, who for instance, also has a specific status under international law in armed conflicts. Like, I know this is a different body of law, it's international humanitarian law, but it also preserves the core values that are represented in human rights law. Right? Um, NGOs are extremely important on the national and the interstate level, and basically also on the international level that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, in raising awareness about rights. Mm -hmm. Diplomats don't always think about what's going on. Governmental officials often miss that the rights of individuals can be violated through a certain policy. They lobby, they campaign either for implementation of rights and they also lobby for change of policies and change of laws that violate rights. They highlight abuses. They're extremely good in using the media to carry this news not only to decision makers but also to the larger population that can put pressure on the decision makers. How? By saying, I'm not going to vote for you again if you're going to pass such laws. I'm not going to vote for you again so you can be in government and make policies that, and make policies that aren't in line with human rights legislation that my country has to obey because it is bound by them, it consented to them through international treaties, right? And then, I know that somebody mentioned universal jurisdiction before, there are some human rights norms, really not a lot of them, but there are some of them that every single country in the world has to respect, even if it hasn't consented to the document that includes that human right. Like, this is not important, but we call those kind of human rights, we call them peremptory norms, use Kogan's norms, uh, peremptory norms, yeah, it, it, do, it doesn't really matter. But what matters perhaps is the content, what kind of norms are these, what kind of norms have to be obeyed by 
everyone. Right to life. No. It's war crimes. Oh, no. No. <laughs> no. War crimes? No. They, they, they do have reversal jurisdiction though. No. No? No. And what, what about the case in uh, between... Congo and Belgium? No, it was Spain and... Uh, South America. Ah, doesn't matter. I'll think about it again. Okay. Anybody sure. else? It's even worse than that. It's like the cr they call it the crime of all crimes. Come on. It's the prohibition of genocide. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the prohibition of genocide. I think a couple of days ago, the Spanish government indicted... Universal jurisdiction means that I can try anyone from any country in the world right. in front of my own courts if they committed a crime that I have universal jurisdiction for. Prohibition of genocide being one of such norms. And for instance, a couple of days ago, the Spanish, the Spanish judiciary indicted two former and two, two uh, incumbent uh, uh, Chinese officials for the genocide uh, in Tibet. This is like this. I, I, I'm not going to comment on whether on whether they actually have the facts to do that. But all these decisions don't just affect the legal human rights framework. Obviously, they heavily impact relations between states and they heavily impact international politics. Right? This is universal jurisdiction. The other crimes that are undisputedly in this category of peremptory norms for which we have universal jurisdiction are crimes of torture. Uh, and then there's, uh, this one is very indirectly related to human rights, but it's uh, war of aggression. So if somebody unilaterally attacks another country and violates its territorial sovereignty, which is bound to end up in some human rights violations because people will die. And uh, uh, prohibition of slavery, this one's directly related to human rights. And the last one is piracy, which is, which is again very indirectly related to human rights. So those Be are the four or five that are preemptory. We can, we can all prosecute that. We can all prosecute people that are responsible for those crimes, for those violations of human rights, anywhere, can you repeat in them? any country. Can you repeat them, please? Prohibition of genocide, slavery, torture, war of aggression, and piracy. But the definitions for these terms are really restricted. Uh, depends on the courts. Depends on the courts. Like this, is, this, this is, definitions are something that is really not political here. I think it's the only thing that's not political. Definitions of these crimes are made by courts sometimes by quasi-judicial bodies uh, in the UN that I'm going to mention later. But this is, this is the most legal part of human rights protection, in my opinion. Yeah. So how can like, a court in, I don't know, China try something that happened in South Africa and still have the necessary means to like, progress with a normal trial? Like, how do they actually get the person from that country to their own to try In a lot of cases, I think that in a lot of cases this would be a symbolic move through which a country uh, through which a country establishes and lets other people know of its position about a certain human rights violation. Often these trials will end up in nothing. Often these trials will never take place. I think that the Spanish they'll never get those three Chinese people. Right? They but they made a stance. They said, like, we don't like what you're doing in Tibet. We've taken some measures in political bodies, and this is a judicial me uh, measure that we're, also going, that we're also going to take in order to promote the prohibition of genocide as a universal human rights norm throughout the globe. That's why I'm saying not everything is legal. Lots of it is political. Lots of it is symbolic. But I think that it does have effect because it attracts the attention of other countries that perhaps want to join in in something like that. One of, one of such amazing cases was also, I, I guess you all know who Augusto Pinochet was, yeah. right? right? He wasn't tried in Chile, 
Mm -hmm. right? He was tried in Spain. Yeah, he was tried in Spain, but at first he was held in the United Kingdom, and, and then he said that he has immunity and that he shouldn't be extradited to Spain, but then they said, ah no, but you committed torture, and torture is some torture against Spanish citizens, and this is something that is under universal jurisdiction, therefore we can extradite you to Spain, right? And this is how politics and law together shape a very imperfect, but still a relatively effective system of interstate and international human and rights. They have protection. the right to not extradite if, for example, some of the, they went against these universal jurisdiction principles. So if like somebody actually like committed genocide, they still have the right to not give him away, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. So only works one. Of course. But what's then going to happen is, is that a state that might have a very strong interest in that person being extradited will sue someone in front of the International Court of Justice and say it is your obligation according to international law to extradite this person. You are, you are committing an internationally wrongful act for not doing it. We're going to sue you in the Hague and you're going to pay big money for that and you're going to have to extradite him as well. Right? And this was the Congo-Belgian case with the minister Eurodia was, was, was one of such cases. Um, uh, okay, so this is, this, is, this, is, this, uh, this is the civil society. One ver very important point, uh, one very important point regarding the civil society is that it assists those that are actually subjected to human rights abuses. Like, governments often have very inefficient or don't even have programs that deal effectively with the victims of human rights abuses. Like, they, they don't have agencies that would assist uh, that would assist victims of human rights abuses to bring I don't know compensation claims against those who have violated their rights they don't have agencies that would assist in the re-socialization of the victims and and whatever whatever the victims need that's why we need uh, that's why we need NGOs and civil society initiatives on all of the levels of human rights protection as well. Okay, so these are the, these are the two levels and one extra uh, and one extra agency that I wanted to talk about. Now the international level. Here the story becomes somewhat different because I'm not going to say that the influence of a particular state is eliminated, but at least it's not as big as on the interstate or the state level, the, well, obviously the state level, because that's where the interest of the state is uh, most important, right? Um, on the international level, we have political bodies that can protect human rights, and we have judicial bodies that can protect human rights. I think that the most important institution um, is definitely the United Nations. That's where most of the human rights treaties are born, drafted, adopted, signed. The, the United Nations building in Geneva and New York are the places where, uh, where states express their consent, that they're willing to be bound by certain human rights norms. And lots of political, quasi-judicial and judicial processes take place uh, within the jurisdiction of the United Nations. Now, if we're talking about political, organs, political bodies, agencies that can protect human rights. If we're talking about the United Nations, which are those bodies? I mentioned one already before. We're talking about the political ones. International Court of Justice. That's a judicial one, right? That's not political. Or yes, yes. at least we hope that it's not a political one. The Security Council. The Security Council is one of them. The Security Council can either by authorizing uh, authorizing the application of the responsibility to protect, um, or, uh, or for instance by passing resolutions through which it puts obligations on states to do as much as they can. I know this sounds extremely vague, but that's how international politics works. 
uh, that they have to do as much as they can in order to implement, uh, to implement certain human rights norms. And the prime example for how Security Council acts in order to protect specific human rights are women's rights. There have been three very powerful resolutions uh, on the issue of women's rights and what states need to do in order to protect those rights. The tagline, the tagline for all of the resolutions was um, women's rights are human rights too, which I think was a little bit weird, but, but, but it worked. It, it, it worked. Like, I come from an extremely, I come from Slovenia, it, this is an extremely small country, we're definitely pretty much insignificant in world politics. So, even if we don't do what the Security Council tells us that we should do, some people will pay attention, but not many, I think, <laughs> right? When I worked for the Foreign Service, I worked at the Human Rights Department, at the Foreign Ministry, and I had to deal with these three resolutions, and I had to write reports what we're doing, so the Security Council would be happy. You can't imagine how much work they gave me. Like, like seriously, through every sector of government, uh, writing reports about how, human, how, how women's rights are protected in the army, how human rights are protected uh, in the police forces, like all the very sensitive areas where you often have violations of women's rights. So this is one of the ways how we can protect them through political mechanisms. The other one, obviously, is the General Assembly. That's the largest organ of the United Nations. Every single member of the United Nations sits there. Even, the, even non-members, like observer entities, observer states, international organizations sit there. Uh, but most importantly, it's the sovereign state. It's the sovereign states that draft treaties, accede to treaties, and report on the implementation of treaties in this, uh, in this organ, in the General Assembly. So basically, the main function of the General Assembly is that it sets norms that states, have to, uh, that states have to obey. Obviously, only if they want to. An interesting information, and I'm not picking on the Americans, but an interesting information, which is the most ratified human rights treaty in the world? Does anybody know? The United Nations, the Human Rights Declaration. Is That's that not a convention. The human rights, this is, this is a, a common misconception. The Declaration of Human Rights is not a binding document, because states never consented to that, because it was just a resolution that the General Assembly passed. It needs to be called a convention, so it actually creates legal effect. And the most ratified convention is the Convention on the Rights of the Child from 1989. And two weeks ago, two countries announced that they are willing to accede to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. They are very suspicious countries. One of them is Somalia, the other one is South Sudan. And this is not really newsworthy, but what's new... Sorry? Sorry, no, just a reaction. Uh, but what's really newsworthy, that when these two countries actually become parties to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the United States will be the only country in the world that will not have ratified this convention. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is like a really sad example of um, American is isolationism, exceptionalism in, in international law. Like, you could, you could understand it that with, like, really sensitive sovereignty, security issues, that this would be the case, but not with children's rights. Like, there are many reasons for that. I'm not, I'm not going to go into them right now, because we don't have time. Uh, but it's an interesting piece uh, of information. Uh, okay. Yeah? Just, uh, what, what is then actually a resolution again? Again, the difference between a resolution and a convention is then the resolution is just an uh, idea or what? Or is it just uh, the The resolution <laughs> doesn't create... The, the re, a resolution doesn't create binding obligations. Okay. A convention creates binding obligations. A resolution just says, it would be really nice if we had this. A convention says, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to have. Also, a resolution, the voting procedure is different, right? When you pass a resolution, a majority is enough. 
So, okay. and the resolution is adopted. The convention uh, 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 steps into force if it has a certain number of ratifications, right? So assume that as the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, was ratified by 30 states, it became a binding document for those 30 states and every single other state that decided to accede to the document later on. So, so this is the difference. So this is the difference. Just somebody brings up and then people can... It's not just somebody, it's like a very complex procedure. It goes through different committees, lots of, lots of lobbying is involved, lots and lots of bureaucracy is involved. And then in the end, countries vote on it. If the majority is in favor, uh, the resolution is passed. If they're not in favor, the resolution is not passed. But even if it's passed, it doesn't mean a thing. It, it mean, it's a political statement. It, it's, it shows political will, or perhaps the lack of political will, to protect certain rights, right? Um, uh, the thing is that the Universal Declaration for Human Rights was... Uh, was uh, all, all member states voted in favor of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but the UN only had 58 member states when the resolution was adopted. And in a world of 193 states, as we know it today, we're not completely sure if we would have such a majority or if we would even have a majority for such a broad-reaching document, right? right. So that's like a, a, a very uh, historic, historical circumstances make the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, as important as it, as it is today. Uh, okay, the, uh, the last important, really important political organ is the Human Rights Council. This one's not in New York, this one's in Geneva, it was established by a different body uh, in New York. Geneva is supposed to be the capital of human rights uh, in the world because you have all these committees that deal with the different conventions, they, they, they sit in Geneva and the Human Rights Council sits uh, in Geneva. Now the Human Rights Council is a very wishy-washy organization that nobody really knows what precisely they can do and what, what they cannot do at all, but they, they did some, some important things. Mostly it raises awareness about violations of human rights. For instance, when, when we talked about the NATO strike in Libya, a couple of years ago, the Human Rights Council passed a resolution of all the violations of human rights that took place during the NATO strike. So, when people say, oh, this is such a Western institution because human rights are a Western concept, mm -hmm. no. When you need to point a finger at the Westerners, the Human Rights Council is more than willing to do so. Um, uh, uh, but the most important thing that the Human Rights Council does is the so-called Universal Periodic Review. And this is something that I would strongly suggest for you to take a look at when you're doing research on human rights. Um, the Universal Periodic Review is a procedure through which, <coughs> <coughs> through which countries have to report on the general situation of human rights in their territory and they're being examined by every single other state in the world. So, for instance, when Slovenia has to present a report on what the situation of human rights in Slovenia is, every single other government in the world can ask us questions, they can give us recommendations, um, they can give other countries recommendations what they should do to improve a human right, the human rights situation in our country. Again, it's a process that's not based on law, it's based on pressure and on information sharing. Right? Uh, and this is where you get tons of information about human rights abuses from all around the world. Yeah. What about the regional system, the Court Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, for instance, and the, the African Court of the Human I'm, Rights? I'm, I'm getting to that now. I'm getting, I'm getting to that now. This, this is a very universal system this is, that doesn't deal just with specific regions, but deals with all regions from all around the world. Right? It's all self-reporting. 
Right. Ah, it's all self-reporting, and that's the big disadvantage of it, because you can say, oh, we're doing... Obviously, I was in on writing the report for the Universal Periodic Review as well, and I was like, yeah, but this is such a selective report, like, we're, we're only writing down the good stuff, and with the bad stuff, we're just saying, we are also working on improving the situation <laughs> in this field. And obviously, that's why this peer review is extremely important, because other countries, everybody is advised by the civil society. Like, Amnesty International Slovenia will come to the foreign ministry and say, you need to put this into the report, like, other countries need to hear about this issue. And obviously the foreign ministry usually says, yeah, okay, right, mm -hmm. go away. But then Amnesty International Slovenia will also go to other countries in Geneva and say, you should ask our government about this. You should also recommend that they do this, okay. right? So it's, a, so it's a system that encompasses the civil society, and the government. It's a system that includes information sharing, reporting, and putting pressure on decision makers. And that's how it becomes an effective tool of human, of human rights protection. And this is, this is something that has been a huge advancement in human rights protection in recent years. Because we only have the Human Rights Council since 2005. So it's like an institution that's less than 10 years old and already produced a lot of positive reports. The circles of reporting are five years long. We're currently in the second one. And the follow-up already shows that recommendations are being taken into account by the governments that did the reporting uh, in the first round. Uh, it's really important because it is universal and because it's periodic. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's not completely universal anymore because Israel stepped out of the system because they said that everybody's picking on them. <laughs> but it's the only country that's not participating in universal periodic review. So these are these are these are the these are the, these are the, uh, these are the political mechanisms. And then we have yeah yeah yeah. Are these documents in the public domain? Yeah, of course, everything's public. You just go on the website of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and there is the link to the Human Rights Council. You can just like Google Universal Periodic Review or Human Rights Council, it's the biggest link on the website. And then you have tons of documents for specific rights, for specific situations, recommendations by individual countries, like you can find everything there. And it's very well organized. It's a really good system of information sharing and monitoring. Um, the other institutions on the international level are judicial ones. Uh, we don't have a world human rights court. Uh, in my opinion, this is something that should definitely be a topic for debate. Um, uh, because we have a lot of universal human rights treaties. Some that encompass a large number of rights. Uh, like the International Covenants on politic, uh, Political and Civil Rights on the one hand and Economic, Social and Cultural Rights on the other. Uh, but there is no such legal institution that would enforce, the, that would enforce uh, uh, those rights. Um, what we do have are regional judicial mechanisms. And this is where, and this is where also the Inter-American Court of Human Rights plays a very important role. I said that um, I said that Europe is considered to be the most progressive, um, the most progressive system uh, of human rights protection. That's basically because of the European Court of Human Rights. It takes in hundreds of cases mm -hmm. each year. Uh, a lot of them are dismissed because the court either doesn't have jurisdiction or the victim doesn't really have a case. But a lot of cases are resolved. The court is extremely efficient. Its judgments are short. Uh, they are comprehensible, like uh, normal uh, mortals can read them. They're not written <laughs> in an extremely complicated language. And they show precisely why a certain country is violating human rights, uh, the human rights of its citizen or another citizen that used to be in their territory and the country violated their rights. Um, uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, is extremely important because it focuses on the reparations to the victims. 
The problem of the European court system is that it really doesn't have a strong implementation mechanism. So we have a court that identifies human rights violations, that develops the law on human rights, but when it comes to the final solution, like paying, rep paying compensation, uh, um, making possible reparation in other, uh, in other forms, they don't really have a mechanism and the European countries often don't want to implement those judgments and then the trials take like ages to be finished. Sometimes victims even die before the process is finished and then their, and then their, uh, then their uh, families have to file in another claim and it just goes on and on. It's, I'm not saying that most of the cases are like that, but those are one of the, some of the problems. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights is more efficient with regard to that, not because, not because uh, it would have its own enforcement, uh, enforcement police or whatever you want to call it, but because it has a different status in those countries. It's a question of the implementation of judgments, it's not a question of law, it's a question of the political will in certain countries or in certain human rights systems. Uh, research, empirical research shows that this political will is very strong in the inter-American system and people suggest that this is because it's very victim-oriented. So it, what the European court does is usually it awards compensation to the victim. Uh, the amounts are reasonable, but that's about it. That's what the victim gets. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights has a very thorough explanation of what reparation means and it's aware of the fact that often compensation is not the first thing that victims of human rights abuses seek, right? Uh, it's, it's other things. It's the acknowledgement that a crime actually took place. It's because they want to be seen as a victim. It's because they want change in a law or policy. And they can't do it in their own states, so they have to do it through an international mechanism. And that's why uh, international litigation in reg regional human rights courts is an extremely important and a very effective mechanism of human rights protection. Tuna's already looking at me through the window because it's 3.58. I'm very happy that you participated in this so much and it wasn't just me who was talking. Um, uh, we're going to have some human rights motions at the academy and at the tournament and I hope that this will be at least to a certain degree possible, uh, helpful, and uh, at least that it's going to guide your research on human rights a little bit. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.